chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, in Jesus' name. Now, when we get to the building tonight at 6, um, save all your questions for when we get back to the church. As I said, we don't want to spend a lot of time taking up unnecessary time. I want you to look through the building, amen, see every part of it. But any major questions, amen, save them for when we get back here so we're not spending a lot of time over there taking up that gentleman's time because he's going to be missing his church service tonight, amen, to show us the building. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, the Bible says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. I want you to notice what Jesus said. You are salt and you are light. You are salt and you are light. Salt and light make a difference. Salt and light make a difference in the environment in which they are applied to. And I want to minister this morning on making a difference. Everybody say making a difference. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Brother Kicklider, ask a blessing on the word of the Lord. Lord, we love you, mighty God. We thank you, Lord, for being here. I ask you, Lord, to bless your word, Lord God. Bless Brother Yusuf Ham. Every heart here, God, to see in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. I thoroughly believe that God has placed his church, I'm talking about us this morning, you and me, in a position of power and authority so that we can make a difference. We as the church, we are not just to take up space. We are not a social club. We are not a gathering place just because. But we are here by divine appointment that we are making a difference in our community. We are making a difference in the lives of those that are around us. And if we are not making a difference, if we are not causing an effect, amen, no matter how small, then we are failing our mission. We are failing our purpose. We are failing our reasoning for being here. The scripture tells us that we are salt and we are light. And as you know, those of you that like salt, amen, it affects the way that your food tastes. It is supposed to bring out flavor that is, is not there. Amen. Light makes a difference because light will drive out darkness. Light will expose flaws. Light will expose areas that need to be corrected. Things that salt and light makes a difference in the natural realm. And you and I, we live not only in a natural realm that we are to make a change and an effect in, but yet also we live in a spiritual realm because we are spiritual beings. We are children of God. We've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And we need to understand, we need to recognize that we need to make a difference, amen, in the area in which we live. When people run across us, when people come in contact with us, they ought to not only be able to see a difference in our lives, but they also should able to be able to feel a difference in our lives. When we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we are to live holy lives unto God. We can no longer walk according to the course of this world, the fashion of this world, and the thinking of this world. But yet we also ought to be living a spiritual life. Amen. That when someone comes into our presence, they can feel the power of God because we should be a carrier of the presence of God. And if we are a carrier of the presence of God, then that presence of God that dwells within our life should reach out and affect others that are around us. Can somebody say amen? So we should truly be a Christian, a child of God, someone that is called out, amen, marching to the drumbeat of heaven, listening to the trumpet of Jesus Christ, that we are making a difference. And Life Church, 
since we are a part of Life Church, needs to make a difference. Richard Trench said this, prayer is not getting man's will to be done in heaven, but it's getting God's will to be done in earth. Prayer is not getting man's will to be done in heaven, but it is getting God's will done on earth. It is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of God's willingness. You say, what does that mean, Brother Yuzapan? It means simply this. There are times that we've got to pray through ourself. We've got to press through our flesh that what we are desiring for and what we are longing for and what we are thirsting for is not our will, but the will of God to be done. God is not reluctant. Amen to move in our midst, but he wants us to be at the place, amen, that we are at the place of acceptance, that Lord, we want your will, we will yield ourselves, we will surrender ourselves, we will give ourselves to you, and when we come to that place, and we walk in alignment with the will, the plan, and the purpose of God, amen, God's willingness is going to be shown, God's favor is going to be shown in our midst, and it's going to go beyond the four walls of this building. It's going to go beyond, amen, the arena, the environment, the arena of our life. And it's going to touch others. It's going to make others take notice. And they're going to say, hey, what's different about you? Where do you go to church? What makes you so different? I feel something about you. That's the way it ought to be. Amen. We ought to have a good report. We ought to have a good testimony. We ought to shed good light among those that are around us because we are a witness for Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are supposed to be the church body for Jesus Christ. The forces of hell try to plunge the world into darkness and chaos. And you can pick up the paper, you can listen to the radio, you can watch the news, and you can see we are living in a chaotic world. And let me just go ahead and say this. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not an independent issue. It's a spirit of hell that's trying to divide a wedge, people among people, so people kill people that will send people to hell. I believe that. It's not a Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer issue. It's not a Donald Trump issue. Amen. It's, amen. it's an issue that goes far beyond that. And so we need to love God as the church of the living God. That in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of the problems that are going on in the political arena, we can show that there is hope. We can show that there is a way. We all somebody shout amen. We can show that there is a better way and there is amen, a light, amen, and we can make a difference in their life. Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. The forces of hell try to ensnare and enslave mankind, making them to fall under the power of Satan. In fact, the Bible declares this in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, where in time past, talking to the church, talking to you and me, you walked according to the course of this world. You know, people say, well, you know, I, I was living my own life. I was doing my own thing. Wrong. Wrong. You were blinded. You were walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. But what made you think you were doing your own thing, walking according to your own path and your own, own way? Satan was controlling you by your fleshly desires and by your fleshly appetites, giving you the illusion that you were doing what you wanted to do. But in actuality, you were falling, amen, according to the greatest trick and the greatest lie that has ever been known to mankind. You were enslaved by him, among whom also we had our conversation or our lives in times past, fulfilling the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh and mind, and were by the nature of wrath, even as others. You want to know why some people are so weird today? Because they're walking according to the flesh. 
and the flesh that is left unchecked becomes more depraved. It becomes more weird. It begins to look for other areas of satisfaction for the cry and the longing of their soul. Amen. And the only answer to that problem is Jesus Christ. I said the only answer to that problem is Jesus Christ. And we as life church and we as saints of God, our lives need to be at the place that we are making a difference. Can somebody say amen? That they will feel the power and the touch of God. The other day I was walking out to my truck and the lady that runs two sisters right next to us was pulling out. She stopped and rolled down her window. I walked over to her vehicle and I said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? She said, would you pray for me? I said, yes, ma'am, I will. And I said, why don't we just pray right now? And I think that may have shocked her just a little bit. I don't know, but she put her car in park. I reached into her window. I laid my hand upon her, and I began to pray in Jesus' name. And while we were praying, amen, tears were beginning to stream down her face. What will that lead to? I don't know. But yet there was something that touched that lady that day that she is never going to be able to escape. And I thank God that I was at least sensitive enough to the Holy Ghost that I would pray for her, even though I was on my way somewhere to do something. I took those two minutes out. I took those three minutes out, not just to wave and say hello, but yeah, I'll pray for you, not only in the future, but I'll pray for you right now. This is not only the pastor's job, but it's the saint's job as well. Amen. That we get a hold of God. We recognize the seriousness of the hour, that we are going to be light, and we are going to be salt, and we are going to make a difference, and we are going to help someone. I want to thank those that came out to visitation yesterday that passed out flyers and, and talked to people, invited them to church. And as we were getting ready to leave where Ezra and I were going, my little six-year-old wanted to go with me. Amen. There was two little kids on the front porch. I said, you want to go invite them to church? She said, yeah. So she walked up to them in her own shy little way, looked back at me. She gave them a flyer, and I said, well, invite him to church. Say, I would like for you to come to church with me. So she did, and the little kid said, okay. And I told her, I said, Ezra, I said, you invited your first person to church all by yourself. And I said, you want to go with Daddy again when we do it again? She said, yeah, I do. Amen. Oh, somehow, if it can excite us, amen, no matter what our age, that we can touch someone. We can reach out to someone. Can somebody say amen? We can show them and we can offer them a better hope. We need to understand we need to make a difference because that's what we're here for. It's not for our 50 and no more, but it's for whosoever will. Let him come unto me and drink that we are going to show the world the light. We are going to show the world that there is light in the midst of their darkness that Jesus can turn their life around. Amen. This is the battle that we face. You know, I'm going to tell you, and I've said it before, but I'm going to re 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 reiterate again. S Satan does not like what's going on in this church right now. He doesn't like it. He is fighting us tooth and toenail. But as we sang this morning, we're going to overcome. Amen. Because God's on our side fighting our battle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is our battle. We stand in the breach. We stand in the gap. We are the last line. Think about it like this. You as saints of God, we as the church of the living God, we can be the last line of defense for somebody for peace and salvation or utter destruction. The Bible says in Ezekiel 22 and 30, he said, I sought for a man among them that they should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I don't want it to be said about life, church. You hear me? I don't want it to be said about Life Church or the people in this church that we don't have time to stand in the gap. Yeah, there are times that we may have to lay some things aside for the kingdom of God. But when we recognize the spiritual benefits of what we are laying aside for the moment are going to far outweigh any earthly pleasure or any earthly gain that we may be able to obtain or enjoy, our business should be the king's business. 
I said, come on, church. Our business should be the king's business, and I'm going to be focused upon him. I am going to love him. I am going to worship him. I am going to seek his kingdom. I'm going to seek his will. I'm going to seek his plan, that I am going to stand in the gap and make a difference. Somebody shout amen. amen. You want to know one of the reasons why we haven't seen the results that we want to see so far? I'll tell you why. Because the devil's holding it, trying to hold it back. But there's something that's going to about to break in the spiritual realm. I feel it in my spirit. Amen. It's building. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And when it breaks, there's not a devil in hell that's going to be able to stop the floodwaters of the Holy Ghost. You hear me? So we don't need to quit praying. We don't need to quit worshiping. We don't need to throw in our hands up in the air and quit. Amen. And begin to feel sorry for ourselves or get discouraged. But it's time to put the pedal to the metal as we used to say many years ago and let it roar. Amen. We're going to put it in overdrive and we're going to go forward in the name of Jesus. We're going to worship our way through. We're going to pray our way through. We're going to testify our way through because we are an overcomer in Jesus name. Everybody say push. push. What does push stand for? Pray until something happens. Amen. Pray until something happens. We need to push in prayer. Amen. Then God results will begin to happen. But I wonder how many times we quit praying just short of our miracle because we've got discouraged. I'm sure there's been things in my life, amen, that God wanted to do, but I quit because I got a little bit discouraged. And I'm going to tell you, it's easy to get discouraged. Yeah, it is because, you know, human tendency. Amen. Amen. But we don't need to be silent. We need to shout it from the rooftops, amen, that we are overcomers and the enemy is not going to triumph. For you need to understand, folks, it's just, it boils down to this. There are two kingdoms in this world. There are two kingdoms in this world. It's the kingdom of God and it's the kingdom of hell. The kingdom of God will bring forth Jesus' will, plan, and purpose. Why the kingdom of hell wants to oppose his will, his plan, and his purpose. And if hell can trip you up, if hell can mess you up, if hell can get you discouraged and get your eyes off the goal, then that's what he's going to do. But somehow, by the will of God, we're going to pray. We're going to push until something happens. Amen. We're going to keep our focus upon Jesus. We're going to love him, and we're going to worship him, and we are going to realize that we are making the difference in our area. We may not see what we want to see right now, but if we keep going on, if we keep moving forward, if we keep pouring on the fire, amen, the Holy Ghost is going to spread. The fire is going to fall, and God's going to be glorified. And when we seek God, amen, he's going to rain righteousness upon us. When we seek his face and we love him, then the signs and the wonders and the miracles are going to happen in this house I believe it I believe it I want you to go back over the past year and a half that we've been here a little more than a year and a half now and and, and notice when things amen those that were here started falling by the wayside or, or started missing a lot of church when did it start happen when we really started pushing Amen. Prayer and worship and miracles and signs and wonders. You think it just happened accidentally? No, it's, it's, it's wrapped up. I made the statement before the end of last year. I don't remember if I made it October, November, whenever it was. But I said something like this. I said, if you don't get in this thing, amen, you're not going to be here next year this time. Anybody remember me saying that? Amen. 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 I don't want to. I don't want to miss out. I want to recognize. Amen. That I want to make a difference. And I pray for those people that are falling by the wayside that they will get a hold of God because that's the answer they're looking for. Amen. They say I've got problems. Hey, when you got problems, where do you need to be? In church. I've heard people say, "Well, I got to get my life straightened out to come to church." No, you come to church the way you are to get your life straightened out. Amen. Amen. When we try to do it the other way, it's never going to happen. But we're going to come to church. Huh. Some people say, I don't want to come to church because of the hypocrites. You ever heard somebody say that? 
I ain't going to that church because there's a lot of hypocrites. Well, I'd rather go to church with the hypocrites than go to hell with them. And I don't say that with a spirit of arrogance, but let, them, let the hypocrites be in church because at least they have a chance to get right. Have you ever thought about that? Amen. The hypocrites have a right and a place to get right with God as long as they're coming to church. And maybe in a sense we're being hypocritical and we don't realize it. Well, that church is not full of perfect people. Well, duh! You show me any church that is full of perfect people. Well, I got mad at so-and-so, and I ain't going back to that church. Well, do you get mad at Walmart and quit going to Walmart? Get mad at your doctor and quit going to your doctor? How many, how many, how many times you got mad at your job, brother, uh, or your boss? Probably a bunch of times. But have you quit your job? May have felt like it. Amen. And so this, this excuse, I'm going to get mad and quit church, that's, that's just a bunch of rubbish. That tell, uh, uh, boy, I don't know why I'm saying this this morning, but that tells me your spirit's not right. Amen. That's right. Amen. I've had my feelings hurt in church. I've had people talk bad about me, talk bad about my wife, talk bad about my kids when it was undeserved. We ha I had a lady one time, she wasn't coming anymore, but she threatened the life of my wife and my daughter, tried to run them over with her car. Oh, I'm not making that up. I've had so-called ministers that sat in the same church that were supposed to be working with me, criticizing me behind my back, tearing me down, stopping the move of the Holy Ghost, stopping revival. So I know what it's like. I know what it's like. I had one lady and family get mad at me because I told them that I didn't want them talking, amen, some of the junk that they were talking in church. I went up to them real nice. It was on, I think it was a Sunday morning, I think. Amen. The, the, this family was a large family in the church, and they didn't like one of the young ladies that was coming to church. They didn't like one of the young ladies that was coming to church. I said, man, don't talk that stuff here. If that's the way you feel you want to keep it at home, keep it at home, but it's not right. You don't need to do it in church. You know what they did? They got up. They walked out of church. She called the bank, stopped payment on her tithe check. And I only had like three or four tithe payers at that time because when I got to this church to take it, they were so mad at the previous pastor when the new pastor came in. I lost 30 people two weeks after I got there. And so this family walked out after a couple of months. But you know what? God's was still good. God was still good. So I know what it's like to be hurt. I know what it's like to be ridiculed. But you know what? I've got a greater vision. I've got a greater hunger. I've got a greater desire that I want to make a difference somewhere. Can somebody say amen? And I believe that there is a church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, that wants to make a difference. And we are going to make a difference. We're going to be like salt. We're going to be like light. We're going to overcome hell. We're going to overcome the powers of darkness. And we are going to win souls for Jesus and we are going to see him do what he wants us to do. So the forces of evil want to try to stop us and hinder us. But we're not going to stop. We're going to go forward in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. You know, we say, why is God not answering prayer? Why does it seem like God's not answering prayer? It may not be that God's not answering prayer, but could it be that the enemy, amen, is resisting the answer of our prayer? You say, Give me Bible to prove that. Go to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, the angel speaking to Daniel. For from the first day that thou settest thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard. When you pray in sincerity, when you pray earnestly, you pray according to God's will, the first time you utter those prayers, God hears them. But the Bible says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So for 21 days, there was a spiritual battle that Daniel did not see, and Daniel did not receive revelation until the breakthrough happened. 
But Daniel was persistent in his prayer. Daniel was persistent in his fasting. I am going to seek God until God answers. Oh, somehow, let us get that determination that as salt and light make a difference. Amen. We're going to have the determination that I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to fast. Amen. Until I hear from God. Until I receive. Amen. A yes or a no. Oh, wait just a little while from heaven because I want to make a difference. We are in a battle. We are in a fight. An eternal struggle for the souls of men and women, for your soul, for my soul. Just because you've been in church for years doesn't mean you're exempt. Amen. If the devil can trip you up, he's going to try to trip you up. If he can take you out, that's just a bigger trophy on the shelf of hell. Amen. But we're not going to let him take anybody out of here. Amen. We're going to pray. We're going to push. We're going to fast. We're going to make a difference. We're going to overcome the enemy. Amen. We're going to pray to see the will of the Lord be done. And there are times, there are times that we can change the mind of God. So I don't know about that, Brother Yuspan. God's omnipresent. God's omniscient. God knows everything. What do you mean change the mind of God? Remember, it's so much that God's not reluctant, but laying a hold of God's willingness. When we talk about changing the mind of God, some of you kind of looked at me kind of funny, huh? Amen. Well, let me tell you something. God is not a man that he should lie. God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. What is repentance? Feeling, amen, a, a, a remorse about wrongdoing or sin. God does not repent because God does not do wrong. But when we talk about change, amen, the mind of God, what we are talking about, amen, is changing maybe destruction, and judgment to mercy. I'll give you an example found in Scripture. Genesis chapter 18. Amen. Abraham stood before the Lord, verse number 22. And Abraham said to the Lord, Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Pray adventure there be 50 righteous within the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Will thou destroy the city for 50 righteous? Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were very wicked cities. Amen. They were very perverse. Amen. In fact, the Bible says this in, in, in Genesis uh, chapter 19, that the people, that when the two angels came into the city, that Lot offered them his daughters, amen, to fulfill a irrational and unnatural sexual lust and desire within these people's life. He, he said this, these people said, we will deal worse with you than with them. They were very wicked and perverse. But the Lord said, I'll spare that city for 50 righteous. Then Abraham came again and said, Lord, will you slay the righteous with the wicked? And if, if there's, amen, 40, will you, will you spare 40 and 5 or 40 and 5? And then he went down to, to 40. Uh, then he went down, amen, as we read, to 30. And then he went down to 20. And then he said, Lord... Don't be angry, but I come to you one more time. Peradventure, that ten be found there. And said, I, then the Lord said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Why did Abraham stop at ten? We know Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. That's only four left the city. Why did Abraham stop at ten? Because I believe that Lot had other family there in that city, at least six more, and Abraham thought they were living righteous lives. Because Abraham did not want to see Lot, his family, destroyed. Because the angels of the Lord say, well, where do you get that from? The, the, as you read in Genesis chapter 18 and, and Genesis chapter 19, the angel said, you know, go, go get your family. And he says, I, I, I've got daughters and, and their husbands. And, and, and these things are mentioned. So maybe also they had children that made up the difference. But the reason why there wasn't 10 is because 
those that were outside of Lot's house weren't righteous and were not living for God. In fact, the Bible says this about Lot. They, he, the Bible calls him in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, amen, a just man and a righteous man. But it goes on to say that this righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In other words, where Lot was living, even though he was righteous before God, the very sin and wickedness was wearying to him, was pulling him down. And if deliverance did not come at that time and that hour for Lot, it is very possible that Lot would have lost out with God. Because the next verse tells us in verse number 9 that the Lord knows how to deliver the righteousness out of temptation. Amen. Think about that for a little while. A little bit of use of pan theology. Abraham entreated for the city, for Lot and his nephew. God's plan originally was to wipe out the cities because of their sin. And that's what happened after Lot and his family got out because God still spared Lot, his wife, and two daughters. But God said, yes, Abraham, I will hear your prayer that if there are just ten righteous, I'll spare them. So I'm here to tell you we can put God's judgment to God's mercy if we will pray, if we will seek the face of Almighty God. You say, well, what do you mean? What I mean is this, that the devil will try to convince you that maybe one of your family members or a loved one or a friend that's on drugs or wiped out with alcohol or living immoral lives, the devil will say, you know, they really deserve calamity. They really deserve judgment. Amen. And so what the devil is doing is just showing you a partial truth. That's how the devil lies. That's how the de devil deceives, by showing just partial truth truths. That's why you don't need to listen to the devil. Amen. And while the partial truth may be right, the heart of God desires mercy. For the scripture says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how bad or how wicked someone may be in your family's life. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. But you begin to intercede. You say, Brother Use Pam, I've been praying for them, and it seems like they're getting worse and worse. Amen. You know why? Because the devil's got them bound, the devil's got them wrapped up, and's got their mind all and their heart all distorted. But you just keep praying. You just keep believing. Amen. You just keep calling upon the name of the Lord. And somewhere down the line, God's light is going to shine forth. And then they're going to come to the realization, am I going to stay in the pig pen? Am I going to stay in this filth? Am I going to stay in this mire? Or am I coming out of this thing? I believe there are people in Nash, Wilson, and Edgecombe County that has experienced truth in their life that they're tired of the filth and the trash that their lives are in, but they don't know where to turn. But we've not prayed for them like we need to pray for them. I want to ask you a question, I, and I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to make a, a, a point here. We've, we've been asking you to pray for several months for another location. Been announcing the church, but how many, you don't have to raise your hand because I don't want anybody to feel guilty. I'm just trying to make a point here. Amen. But how many of you have really taken it upon your heart, God, put, put us in the perfect place? Not where we want, but where you want. We might have done it in church, but I'm talking about carrying it beyond the four walls. Or is it something that when we walk out the door, we leave behind? And the point that I'm trying to make, sometimes we do that with, with people as well. We pray for them sincerely and earnestly in church, but we get so wrapped up when we walk out the doors, we forget about it. We forget about it. Or if we think about them, you know, the first thing flesh wants to say, well, they deserve what they get. They made their bed. Let them lay in it. And that may be true. And sometimes there comes a, 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 a time, amen, that we do not allow ourselves to be abused or used by these people that always take advantage of us. I'll give you an example. There was, it's been a couple years ago now. Uh, there was a guy that had a sign out. Um, you know, hungry, hungry. He's taking up donations. I rolled down my window, or my wife did. Amen. We were together. So we didn't. We weren't going to give him any cash because we didn't want him using on drugs or alcohol. So we'll take you right over here to McDonald's and get a hamburger. I think it was McDonald's, wasn't it? Amen. And he said, "No, I don't want that. I want money." You know, if you're hungry, 
You may not like McDonald's, but by George, if I'm hungry, I'm going to go there. Come on. Another time, guy said, we'll work for cash. I said, okay, I got some things for you to do. Boy, he changed his tune real quick. I'm not kidding you. Amen. So there comes a time and a point that you don't have to let people play on your emotions or try to take advantage of you, but that don't mean you stop praying for them. That doesn't mean you don't stop caring for them. You know, I, I had to, I, we, we had to tell my daughter, this is the way it's going to be. And that was one of the hardest things we had to do. This is the way it's going to be. It's not going to change. Because every time we rescued her, every time I paid for a bus ticket home, every time we brought her home into the house to try to dry her out and get her straightened up, amen. Once she did that, she was back out on the road again. What was she, what was she doing? She was using mom and dad to continue her lifestyle. But when she recognized, amen, that mom and dad weren't going to be pushed around anymore, and we took some grief for it for a little while. Well, why are you treating your daughter like this? Why are you being so mean to your daughter? And I think she even told some people, hey, mom and dad being mean to me. She, we, she kicked us out of their home. No, we didn't kick her out of her home. We just told her this is the way it's going to be. You're going to live in our home. You made your lifestyle choice. You want to live here. This is the way you're going to have to change. Amen. But I thank God, amen, that today she is sitting in church right now with her hands raised to heaven. And those two little babies, Dixie and Danny, who you have not yet met. Amen. Worshiping and praising and loving God. Oh, she's had struggles. She's had some hard times, especially in the last couple of months. Her car broke down. Didn't have the money to fix it. Lost her job because she didn't have a way to get to and from work. But God saw her through. And she's still living for God. She's still living. So don't let the devil rob you. Listen to what the Bible says about what the Lord, Psalms 89 and 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy faith. God desires mercy. God desires truth. So when you pray, God, will you intercede? Will you move? Amen. Yeah, you may seem in a sense being changed in God's mind, but yet it's ultimately fulfilling his goal and his purpose. Intercession has the power to move people from one side to the other. Let me tell you something, prayer warriors of this church, you keep praying for souls. Don't give up. You keep praying for souls. You keep praying for souls. You know, we decide, I decide, you decide whether I'm going to receive mercy and truth or I'm going to receive judgment. It just depends on what I want at that time. And if we love Jesus like we ought to love Jesus, if we stay full of the Holy Ghost and close to the throne of God, we're going to walk in truth, we're going to walk in mercy, and we're going to walk in grace. And when we receive mercy, when we receive truth, and we receive grace, we need to extend that truth. We need to extend that mercy, and we need to extend that grace to those that are around us. Let us never think they're not worthy. As long as they have breath in their lungs, let's give them the opportunity that they can come to this place and repent and be baptized in Jesus' name and be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and hopefully make heaven their home. Everybody say amen. 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 You know, Jonah, he was an unusual character. He was a preacher. He was a prophet, a man called of God. You know the story. The Lord told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. And you know what Jonah did. He said, "Uh uh-uh. I ain't doing it. Do you know why he said that? Anybody know why Jonah said, "Uh uh-uh? I'll tell you why. Number one, the Ninevites were enemies to Israel. There was constant conflict between the Ninevites and Israel. Not only because they, 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 they were godless and they were heathens worshiping a false god, but they hated Israel and Israel hated them. And so Jonah, he didn't want to go to Nineveh because, number one, he didn't know how he would be treated getting up there. Here comes this prophet, and I guarantee they knew who Jonah was. Preaching in their city. Are they going to kill me? Are they going to destroy me? Uh Uh-uh. And then the second reason is because of Jonah's own testimony. Lord, I knew that if I preached and they repented, you'd have mercy on them. And Jonah didn't want them to have a chance to be saved. 
Read it in the book of Jonah. That's basically what it's telling us. He didn't want them to have, they, he, he wanted them to be wiped out because the Ninevites were the enemy. You may have some enemies today that you may not like. And flesh may despise, but you better not let that, that feeling carry over that if they walk in this church, you cannot accept them and you cannot love them. Because we will be wrong. Amen. We will be wrong. Amen. I'm going to say it again. We'll be wrong. And so you know the story. God got a, had to get a hold of Jonah through him. Amen. He tried to run from God. You can't run from God. Amen. Jonah was supposed to go east. Jonah hopped on the boat going west. He didn't get very far. God sent the storm. Jonah was asleep in the, the, the bottom of the boat. Let me tell you something. When you, when you start running from God, it's easy not to recognize God's hand because you're closing your eyes to everything around you. And so the sailors woke up. Jonah, won't you pray to God? And Jonah... So a little bit of a paraphrase, condense it. Jonah said, it's my fault, guys. Just throw me overboard and everything will be okay. And, of course, they didn't want to do that, but ultimately they did. And when they threw Jonah overboard, you know the story that the great fish, amen, the well, Jesus said, swallowed him up. And Jonah was in the well of a belly or a belly of a whale. Either way works. Amen. And he spent a day and a night, three days, in the deep of that well. But while he was down there, he repented. You read the prayer of repentance. And God gave Jonah another chance. So the fish took him to the shore, spit him up. Jonah went into Nineveh and began to preach. Walked through that city. In 40 days, God is going to destroy this city. The king heard it. He proclaimed a fast and said, maybe God. Didn't say Jonah's God, but God would spare us. And they repented, and God spared them. God's mind was changed from judgment to mercy. Judgment to mercy. Folks, let's pray. Let's begin, amen, and make sure that we are making a difference. King Hezekiah was another man. He was one of the most godly kings of the nation of Israel. That, that lived. As you read his, his narrative, his biography, he only made a couple of mistakes. He didn't make very many mistakes according to what Scripture says compared to some of the others like David did. But he still made his mistakes. And for whatever reason, Isaiah came, and the Bible says Hezekiah was sick unto death, Isaiah 38, verse 1. And Isaiah the prophet said, Get thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. We don't know what caused that to happen. We don't know if the sickness was a, a judgment upon Hezekiah because of something that he did. I don't know. Or if it was just a, a sickness of timing. I, I don't know. And then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. And he said, Lord, I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which was good in thy sight and Hezekiah wept so he didn't pray a prayer of pride and arrogance he prayed a prayer of sincerity amen. amen then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah and said I've heard your prayer I will add 15 years to your life and also this caveat was included I will deliver this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city. Let me tell you something. What does that tell me? That tells me when we are willing to pray and we're willing to make a difference and we'll stand our ground. Not only what we are praying for will come to pass, but there are other things, other blessings that God is just going to throw in the mix Amen. because we have been found faithful. We, I don't want to sound mean this morning, but we need to make up our mind. We're going to live for God and quit playing church. 
Amen. I don't want to sound hateful this morning, but we need to make up in our mind that I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be a part of life, church. I'm going to do what's necessary. I'm not going to wait for someone else to do it, but I'm going to step up to the plate. I'm going to give myself. Can somebody shout amen? I'm going to yield myself. I'm going to join forces with my brothers and sisters in the name of Jesus, and we are going to be like salt, and we are going to be like light, and we are going to make the difference. And we are going to see the will of God be done in Jesus' name. The Bible is full where people affect the destiny and the outcome of situations. And what is taking place is God's willingness, amen, is being performed in earth. God is moving from judgment to mercy because there are folks that know how to seek the face of God and feel after the heartbeat of God. I guess the youngest person in this church right now is Jackson. Listen to me, Jack. You're 19 or you're 20 now? You're 20 now. Getting old, huh? Amen. Let me tell you something, young man. You keep yourself holy. You live for God. You serve God. Don't allow the flesh to get a hold of you and pull you down. Because you're going to help save somebody. But if you throw it all away for some filthiness of the flesh, not only are you going to destroy someone that has not crossed your path or has crossed your path, but it will destroy you as well. I guess the oldest person in this church, everybody turned around (laughs) and looked at poor Brother Holland. Okay, Sister Holland, I'll use you. Is that okay? You've been in church just about all your life, I guess. You've seen things happen over the years. How long have you been in church now? You were raised in church, so I'm not going to ask you how old you are. That's, that's improper to ask a woman. I'm sorry. Amen, how old you are. But you've seen a lot. God's carried you through a lot. But don't let your life become polluted. Don't you allow sin. You, some people say, well, I live for God. Sin won't affect me. Oh, it can. It can affect you. Amen. Don't don't throw in the towel because you still have the ability to reach people around you and to make a difference. Amen. I know sometimes we, we get to a certain age, or I've seen people, not me, but get to a certain age and say, I can't make a difference anymore. You know, I, I, I can't make a difference. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You can pray. You can worship. You may not have the strength and the energy that you had 20 years ago. Amen. But you still can pray and make a difference. You can still be a witness and make a difference. Don't let sin destroy you. Oh, come on. Let's worship God. Let's not think that we're of none effect. But every one of us in here can make a difference in Jesus' name. We're going to go forward in the name of the Lord. We're going to make a difference in our church. We're going to be making a difference in our community. We're going to stay and the test of time and we're going to see revival we're going to see anointing we're going to see souls saved we're going to see souls delivered we want grace we want mercy of God to be shown can we begin to cry out let's stand can we begin to cry out church like never before Can we get serious about this thing? That it's time to quit playing games. It's time to make a difference for Jesus. It breaks my heart. and It really does. It breaks my heart and it disturbs me. When God touches people and God answers prayer. And then they slam the door on his face. I don't understand it, and I, I don't comprehend that. I, I, just, I just can't understand that. I just can't comprehend that. It, it's beyond me. It's beyond me. Amen. But let's not give in. Let's not throw in the towel, but let us cry out. Let's intercede to see people, to see those that are around us, to see our area move from the judgment of God to mercy and truth. Hallelujah. To see the purpose, to see the will, to see the plan of God be done. It is not God's will. It is not God's plan that life church 
stay like we are right now. It's not. If you're happy the way it is right now, we, we, you need to pray through. So if you're not happy, what can you do to make a difference? We're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to join hands one with another. And we're going to go forward in the name of Jesus. We're going to go forward in the name of Jesus. We are going to touch someone. We are going to help someone. We are going to encourage someone. Oh, God, that we will be put in the place and in the position to recognize that this is the time. This is the hour that you have called us to. We have been put in a place of authority. We have been put in a position of power. Not just so we can shout and feel a little bit of Holy Ghost boost gum or uh, uh, goosebumps, amen, or talk in tongues a little while or feel good just a little while, but we see his will be done. We see the glory of God be done. That life church makes a difference in Wilson. That life church makes a difference in Nash. That life church makes a difference in Edgecombe County, in these cities, in these communities, in this area, in Nashville, and Amen. All the way down to Wilson. And I know there's some apostolic churches in the area, but I'm not concerned right now about them. And that's the wrong thing to say. I am concerned about them. Yes, I am. But I'm talking about our church. We don't need to sit back and say, well, they're there. No, we're going to reach people. We've got to reach people. We've got to reach people. We've got to reach people. I don't care who they are. I don't care what their background is. I don't care what their address is. I don't care what their lifestyle is. We need to be making a difference. We need to be making a difference. Because that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And everybody say, Amen. Let's love the Lord. Let's sing. Let's worship the Lord. Anticipating the move of God. 